Thank you. Uh, a recurring theme over the last decade or so in the software industry is the growth of data. Some estimates say that we've been doubling the total amount of data in, a little, in as little as every two years. And t to start off with, we didn't really know what to do with all this data we've been recording. As people started to figure out the questions they wanted to ask of their data, the software industry reacted to this. We developed backends and databases to scale that was able to process this data in real time. Technologies like Hadoop, Cassandra, and Spark are now commonplace when dealing with scale of, of data of this scale. And this enables us, as front-end developers, to build front-ends to uh, visualize and explore this data uh, in real time. In this talk, I'm going to show you a couple of products we at Palantir have built out. Um, and, but first, I want to kind of explore what is a good user experience. In my eyes, it's two things. And there's many different ways of cutting it. But I'm going to talk about intuitive and responsive. By intuitive, I'm talking about a user should quickly be able to get a good understanding of what their data is and how they should like, obviously ask questions of it. This is by no means an easy problem. It requires a lot of studying by designers and front-end engineers. Um, but it basically requires a good grasp of who your users are, what their data is, and the kind of questions they want to ask. It can be very dependent on the industry you're developing for, as well as the shape of the data. Uh, so that's intuitive. And responsive, I'm not talking about responsive web design. I'm talking about a responsive application. When a user asks a question of the application, it should be very easy for that user to get the answer they're looking for. It should be very fast. It should be very responsive. Uh, in the enterprise software industry, we've seen a lot of software where the user asks a straightforward question of their data, and it can take minutes, hours, or even days to get a response back. We don't want our users to context switch between answering, uh, asking questions and receiving an answer. Let's talk about earthquakes. Around 30 to 40 years ago, the traditional way of measuring earthquakes was using seism seismological data. Uh, they'd be recorded onto reels like this, which were pieces of paper wrapped around a steel drum. This would move left to right, and the pen would scribble on the page. These days, thankfully, pretty much all of this data is digitized. So there are websites kind of like this one, which have a ton of data spanning about the last week on for thousands of uh, sensor groups all around the world. Here we're going to look at uh, an earthquake that happened earlier in the month uh, off the coast of Chile. You probably heard about it in the news. It was kind of a big one. It was an 8.3 on the Richter scale, so it was pretty big. So here we can see it happened around 11 PM. Uh, maybe we want to see if there's any aftershocks. So we'll plug in the next day, click Update, wait for these spinners to go away, and we'll be able to see that kind of information. Now, this isn't exactly unintuitive, uh, but I can't zoom in and see more of the data. I can't like pan around and compare the aftershocks with the initial quake. I, I'm not able to do that kind of side-by-side -side analysis. And there's these three charts on the screen, all showing slightly different data. But at this level of detail, it's actually not discernible. You can't really make out why it, what these graphs are trying to show. So now I want to show you something that we've built. And maybe the demo, demo gods will let me. So this is Chronicle. This is an application we built for analyzing time series data. Seismological data is just one example. So I'm going to search for Alaska. In early September, there was a swarm of earthquakes off the Aleutian Islands um, in, in Alaska. Now, this isn't a particularly interesting part of the world for earthquakes, um, although there are major flight paths around there. So the US Geological Survey has a bunch of sensors in the area for recording volcano activity. We can immediately see there's a big spike here. So let's select that and zoom in on it. I'm going to get rid of these axes because they're not too important. Um, so we can see here there's a huge cluster of these earthquakes around here. Let's zoom in again. Um, and we can see it gets a bit blocky there. And we're going to talk exactly about why that is a bit later on. Um, so I have enough screen real estate. So I can kind of split these up as well, um, make it a bit easier to figure out what's going on if we don't have them all clashing on top of each other. Um, and maybe I'll recolor some of these kind of boring grays to something a bit more exciting. Cool. So we can now kind of zoom and pan around the data as you'd expect. This is a very like responsive, intuitive application. I'm able to zoom in and see what's going on here. I can hide these axes again. Um, and we can see that this sensor recorded the earthquake uh, a few minutes, a few seconds, maybe, after the other um, sensors. Uh, and that's actually because this particular sensor is on a different island. It's slightly further away. So we can kind of use that to maybe triangulate the position of the epicenter of the earthquake. If you remember your high school geology or university geology classes, you'll know that an earthquake is made up of two component waves, two main component waves. There's a bunch of smaller ones, too. We can see the P wave at the start, and the S wave is the higher frequency wave that comes in, probably around here somewhere. If we wanted to compare this particular quake with the others, we could offset it 
maybe, um, and we can interact with these charts individually, but we have a common scrub bar across the th all three, so we can kind of get a good idea of what's going on. So what I'm trying to show you here is not actually anything to do with earthquakes or seismology. They're both interesting, not ter terribly relevant to JSConf. What I'm trying to show you here is a good, interactive, intuitive way of visualizing a large set of time series data. And that's kind of the key. As an engineer, this is a lot of data. This is very interesting to me. Although, as a user, you can't really tell. There's no indication of how much data is on the screen. Our users don't really care how much data they have. They just care about being able to access it and ask questions of it. For reference, we have four different series here. Each of these are recorded at 100 hertz. So over the entire week of data, that's around 300 million data points. And this is all running on my little laptop. And I'm able to interact with it intuitively and responsibly. This was actually developed for an industry customer. They didn't care about data quite as dense as this. What they really cared about was, but they, they had data of across tens of, different, tens of, different, tens of thousands of different series um, spanning multiple years. And it's used in kind of critical safety of life operations where they need to be able to look at up to 40 series at once of live, incoming, real-time data. Uh, so in total, with the tens of thousands of uh, series over many, many years, they have around 300 billion data points. And they're able to interact with it as if it was one. They don't really care about the data scale. And this is just one way of visualizing large amounts of, uh, of data. I'm now going to show you another. And this is something we built out during Hack Week this year at Palantir. Hack Week is a week where that Palantir has every year where we get to basically work on whatever we want for an entire week. Anyone in the company is allowed to work on any project completely unrelated to their usual work, maybe a feature they want added to an app, maybe an entirely new prototype of an application. And that's kind of what we built out. Um, Hack Week is my favorite week of the year because it gives like, pretty much anyone the opportunity to build something cool and actually form a team around it. Um, many of our great products and features have actually come out of this week. What we're looking at here is a network graph. On this graph, I have US presidential uh, election data from campaign finance data. Uh, this was taken from the last two weeks running up to the US election. And this data set's entirely available online. It's one of the largest that I know of, of these kind of relational data sets. We can see in the middle we have Art Robinson for Congress. This is a polit political action committee. This one particularly supports Art Robinson. However, these committees can either support a candidate or a particular interest group. Around it, in these purple dots, we can see payments. Uh, and the green dots, are, these green nodes, are the donors. So we can kind of evaluate who is giving money to who. Um, in this particular case, we could see that William Brady here is donating is this $200 to Art Robinson for Congress. What's interesting about this data is that while we only took about two weeks of the data, and we only took it for California, there's actually a whole ton of data here. This is all the transactions in the last two weeks. And yeah, maybe this is a comment on the US, US political system. I'm allowed to do that. I'm in Europe. Um, so as we zoom out, we get to see kind of get a good view of the entire data. And we can see some kind of visual artifacts going on. And I'm going to exp explain why these are later on. Um, so here we have the entire set of the data. There's two large blobs in the middle and then two to the bottom right. Uh, it probably won't surprise you that if we use this little tool that we've built to kind of jump in and analyze what's going on in a given area, um, we can find Mr. Obama's political action committees. Um, and whoa, that's way too far zoomed out now. Oh, it's, it's thinking hard. Um, traditionally at Palantir, we've been dealing with these kind of large data sets for a while now. And we didn't think there was actually too much value in a graph of this scale. It's so much data that we didn't think you could actually visualize what was going on. However, when we built it and we kind of took advantage of these features like the loop that I was just showing you, and I'll hope to show you again in a minute uh, when this is decided that it's going to behave again. Um, and through some clever node coloring, I suppose I can fit to screen. Uh, we're able to analyze this large amount of data in a realistic and a easy way. We're ba basically able to see what's going on here. We can zoom in for more information. We can use our loop tool to figure out that, oh, this is Romney's, one of his packs. So it's kind of unsurprising that these large groups are both related to Obama and Romney. Um, yeah. So this is a whole ton of data. And that's kind of interesting to me. It's probably not as interesting to our users how much data we have here. Um, but we're able to interact with it in a realistic way. We're able to like, interact with it. We can move nodes around as we kind of see fit. We can apply layouts. We can follow the links 
So here I can s expand my selection to all of the related links. And we can select all, and we can throw them in a stupid grid. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but we can do it. It's a very responsive, very interactive application, and we can easily get a good visualization over all this data. To use this little tool at the bottom right corner, we have 168,000 objects on this graph. And that's 999,000 donations. We're, for some reason, one shy of 100,000 donations here. Um, so in total, we have 168,000 nodes with 200,000 edges going between them. And this is the kind of the commonality that I see between this and between Chronicle, the one I showed you a minute ago, is that we're dealing with a scale of data that has not traditionally been easy to interact with on the front end. The big difference between these two is this is entirely front end driven. Once I loaded the file from a flat JSON file, I'm, it's entirely, the data is entirely stored on the front end. There's no back end. This is entirely a client side JavaScript project. So with that, I'm going to jump back to the presentation. And there's the demo videos that we don't need to use because the demo gods smiled. Um, so at the heart of both of these applications is a visual display of our data. In one case, this was a series of line charts. And in the other, this was a set of nodes and edges. Both of these are rendered onto a 2D canvas. Now, for those of you familiar with canvas programming, you'll know that there's a ton of drawbacks to using canvas as opposed to traditional HTML, CSS, and so on. In HTML, we can position elements using uh, CSS, we can use tables, we can use divs, we can take advantage of all these fancy React components we've built to easily build together an application. We can use mouse event listeners on individual elements to figure out what the user is trying to do at a given point in time. In Canvas, we get these pretty primitive APIs, and we have to use pixel math to figure out where we're trying to render something. And when a user interacts with the scene, we simply get an event callback saying, with an x and y coordinate, and we have to figure out what was the user trying to do at this point in time. It's also very hard to do anything incremental. With the canvas, it's a rasterized area. So as soon as you paint a node onto it, it's there for good. The only way to get rid of it is to paint something on top or clear the whole canvas down and start again. And this is really annoying. If I'm trying to render a graph that size and I just want to move a node across the screen, I now have to do a ton of work just to make that happen. So the question is, why did we use canvas for this? Um, why didn't we use kind of SVG, D3, four-stroke to graphs? I'm sure we've all seen this demo online. It's a lot of fun to play with. Um, or why didn't we use Plottable for our uh, synchronized line charts? This is the open source uh, charting library that we announced here last year, and we're still actively developing. They even now have an example of synchronized charts on the website, just as if it was trying to tempt me to talk about them. Well, it all comes back to performance at scale. The DOM simply wasn't designed to have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, nodes in it, all animating either independently or in sync. It just doesn't really work. So for earlier versions, we did use this. We, used the, uh, we wanted to use the SVG. However, when you start to move nodes individually, independent from the rest of the scene, things start to slow down. They get pretty sluggish. What am I talking about next? One of the drawbacks uh, that I was discussing was having to re-render everything every frame. And we can actually find a workaround for this. Uh, we can stack multiple canvases on top of each other. Um, for example, in Chronicle, we had a different canvas for each of the different uh, series, uh, the line graphs. Uh, we had a canvas for the axis, and we had a canvas for the controls and the hover. This meant that as a user was hovering over the graph, we, uh, over the chart, we only need to re-render one of the canvases. We didn't need to re-render the entire scene every time. The graph was even more decomposed. We had a different layer for the edges, the selected edges, the nodes, the selected nodes, this drag rectangle box, and, and so on and so on. And this meant that if a user just clicks on a node or if they just do a simple operation, we only need to re-render one or two of the canvases, not the entire scene. And this trick extends to DOM elements, too. We can use absolute positioning to position DOM elements on top of the canvas. This was kind of how the loop tool that I showed you earlier worked. We positioned it to the, uh, to the left of the cursor, um, and then we were able to program in however we wanted the content in there. So we had these little object previews with a table of donations. We can use normal HTML, CSS for that. Um, and this makes things really flexible. We can really easily add extra hints and information about our scene. In an earlier version of the graph, we actually used that for every node. Every node was a DOM element positioned absolutely onto the scene. Then we used trans uh, CSS translations to move the scene around as the user interacted and dragged and panned. And this worked pretty well. We just had a single canvas for our edges, and all of our nodes were very easy to program. It was all kind of very clean code. 
the downside was that as we started to move nodes independently, as we started to push the node scale up to tens of thousands of nodes, things started to slow down. It just isn't designed for this kind of behavior. So this technique of layering Canvas and DOM is really powerful. It's really flexible. But don't expect it to scale with the data. The biggest problem we faced when we tried to scale our graph out to hundreds of thousands of nodes was simply the time it took to render a single frame. Using tools like the Firefox performance tools and the Chrome timeline, we're able to get a really good understanding of what's happening each frame. And I'm not actually going to go into them too much here. There's a load of great resources online about how to use these tools. There's also a load of great resources online about how to do specific canvas profiling and optimizations. Um, however, do take them with a pinch of salt. You'll often find advice like this, avoid shadow blur, which is great. It's got a great intent behind it. Shadow blur can be expensive. Rendering drop shadows turns out to be one of the more expensive operations you can do on a canvas. However, if you want a, a drop shadow on something, it's really bad advice. It doesn't tell me what I should do instead. Uh, we wanted a drop shadow on top of our nodes because you know, it kind of looks cool. So how do we do that? How do we go about doing this? So we came up with a JS perf test to see if we could compare the standard rendering of drop shadows to some other technique of getting the same effect. Um, for reference, this is what we're trying to render. This is a pretty subtle drop shadow. You can just about see it. It's definitely worth all the work we're going to go put into this. Um, so we kind of write our test. We start with a width and a height of the node and the number of nodes we're going to render. We'll choose to render a bunch because the actual drawback of drop shadow is when you render drop shadows on top of each other, the anti-aliasing, I think, don't quote me on this, is what actually causes the slowdown to happen. And then we have this render function. It takes a canvas context and renders a node to it. It takes an x and y position, and that's where it puts it. First, we'll make a radius. We'll set the fill style. We're using this beautiful red color. Uh, and we're going to have a shadow blur of depth 1. Um, for reference, this is what we're trying to render. Uh, so we make an arc, and we fill that with our fire brick red. Uh, and then we'll stroke this, too, to get the white ring around it. And we'll also add an orange stroke. This represents the selection. Um, as you select nodes, they kind of get this orange halo around them. What we're going to do is going to compare rendering directly to the canvas, a 1,000 of these nodes, uh, versus first rendering to an image, essentially rasterizing the node down to an image and reuse that everywhere. So that kind of looks like this. We create a canvas make it slightly bigger to allow for the drop shadow, which is outside of the edge of the node. And you'll note we never attach this to the DOM anywhere. It's purely held in memory. Then we call render node, passing in our canvas with its, the width and the height uh, somewhere in the middle. Our two test cases look a bit like this. We have a canvas, and we pull out the context. We clear it. JSPerf uses the same uh, HTML every time for each of its tests, and it runs multiple ones to create a good uh, aggregate of the number of time spent. And then we iterate through the 1,000 nodes calling render node onto the canvas. Our second test case looks almost identical. The only line that changes is this one. Instead of calling render node, we just call draw image. And this is what it looks like. You'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between the two. Uh, if I didn't say which was which, um, you probably have a good guess, but maybe not. Um, however, the time it takes to render each of these is hugely different. 15.1 uh, milliseconds, for reference, if you want a 60 FPS uh, frame rate, you need to be rendering every frame in under 16.6. So a 1,000 nodes, we can just about do the old technique. With this, we can scale it up much more. The drawback of this approach is that we need a raster image for every different node size. Uh, not quite every different node size. We can actually just choose a few sizes that we care about and then always scale nodes down. The scaling doesn't look too bad, and this way the memory impact isn't that high. Um, and again, we can compute this as a one-off at the start when we uh, initialize our scene. Um, so the takeaway from here, this is not to avoid shadow blur. Uh, if you're just adding it to one or two objects, the cost might not be that high. What you should actually do is profile every change you plan on making. If you're planning on adding shadow blur, profile it. Does it actually make a imp meaningful impact? And if so, are there ways that we can find around this? Another technique we used to kind of push our scale a little bit more was reducing the amount of detail we rendered as the scene, uh, as we zoomed out. So in this example, we render the we kind of lower the opacity on our node labels uh, as we zoom out. Um, once you get beyond a certain zoom level, the labels aren't useful. You can't read them. So there's no reason we should go to all this trouble of rendering this text, which is actually quite an expensive canvas operation. Um, and we do a similar thing with the icons, too. After a certain point, all that really matters is having a purple circle that's the right size. This allows you to pick up, oh, look, there's a lot of interesting things going on here, without having to actually think too much about each individual data point. 
This gives us the aggregation of, of the data. Again, we profile each of these changes. Does it actually make a meaningful difference to our performance? And in this case, it actually did for us. Um, another trick we did was as we moved even further out, once each node was taking up less than a pixel, we just rendered them as rectangles. Rectangles are just quicker than circles. They're just better. So we figured that if the user can't tell that it's a circle, why bother spending all of our beautiful GPU time making these lovely round circles? So the final thing I'm going to talk to you about is debounce. This is a function that lets you split your rendering pipeline into two. The problem that we faced as we kind of tried to scale up our node scale even higher and even higher was that every time, every frame, we were iterating through thousands, tens of, hundreds of thousands, sorry, of edges and hundreds of thousands of nodes. And actually spending the time to iterate through each of these was pretty expensive. It basically meant that our application didn't feel responsive. As a user was dragging and, and panning across the scene, we had to iterate through all these nodes, all these edges, and do some very basic uh, rendering, but this still took up a lot of GPU time. We ended up with a frame rate that was way, way too high, uh, sorry, way too low, uh, and this was just, it just didn't feel responsive. So we used debounce. We debounce the interactions and only call render when the user stops interacting. Now, that sounds kind of insane. If we're not rendering, we're not doing anything. So we just push back the expensive render on this debounce. And in the meantime, we need to find a way of updating our scene without incurring the expensive cost of a render. So how are we going to do that? Well, we can take advantage of the fact that we've just rendered the scene, and the scene we just rendered looks almost identical to the new scene, apart from a few pixels. So we, every time we render the scene, we take a snapshot and save it to an off-screen canvas, just as we did before in the uh, node rendering example. This canvas then holds the entire scene. This can be kind of expensive. Uh, it's not too bad. The bigger the canvas, the more expensive it would be. But it, for our purposes, it works just fine. Then as the user zooms out, for example, we simply take the image, render it onto the screen, to translate it down a little bit. You'll get white boxes around the edge where we don't actually know the state of the world. We haven't been able to do this full render yet. But it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, as you saw earlier, you'll kind of get the white boxes, but you don't really notice if you're going pretty slowly. And if you're going fast, you, as soon as you stop, the full render kicks in. You see the whole state again. And as you zoom in, things get a bit blurry. So if I can see that again. Again, it doesn't really detract. You know where you're trying to zoom into. You can see what you're going for. It doesn't really matter too much. And again, as soon as you stop interacting, the full state of the graph is available to you. We do the same thing for panning as well. We simply translate the image and plop it down. This is even more noticeable. Uh, generally, you pan quite fast. but it doesn't really stop the interaction. You're still able to kind of figure out what you're doing with the scene. Um, and it, it's not long before the full render kicks in, so you're able to see the full scene again. And this allowed us to push that node scale all the way up so that each frame render was no longer dependent on the number of nodes and the number of edges we were trying to render. Our limitation was now the amount of stuff that we could actually store in the JavaScript memory. We actually do a similar trick in Chronicle. If you remember, as we panned left and right, occasionally things would get a bit blocky when we zoomed in, or as we panned, the B sections missing. Um, and this is because we have to request data from our back end uh, every time we want to kind of view any data. Because we're talking about millions, maybe even billions of data points, we need to use a back end to aggregate this data for us. We simply can't do it on the front end. Um, so instead of debouncing the render call, we debounce our request data call. The render is cheap enough, actually. There's not too much data by the time it makes the front end. But the request data call puts a ton of work onto our server. It has to load all this stuff into memory and do some aggregations. It's pretty fast, but it's not the kind of thing where you want to be thrashing the server, making it do a ton of work when no one's ever going to see this. So we debounce this request data call. In the meantime, we still have the data from the previous scene on the front end. So uh, we don't do the canvas tricks. Instead, we just do it with the raw data. We re-render the data we already have for the subset of the scene we're going to know about. So as you zoom out, we can render the same data, just smaller and in the middle. As you zoom in, we can render the data, and that's why it gets a bit blocky. Um, see here, as I pan to the left, there's kind of some data missing. And the same with the right. It actually interacts very similar to the graph. And as we zoom in, it gets kind of blocky. It doesn't really detract, though, because you still have the shape of the data. You still have the same information you had before. Uh, but the back end's pretty snappy, so in no time at all, the real data kicks in, and you're able to kind of continue your analysis. This is very similar to how Google Maps works with vector tiles and that sort of thing. Um, so to quickly sum up, we talked about what makes a good user experience. And this kind of 
idea of both making an intuitive user experience and a responsive user experience. Um, we talked a little bit about decomposing the scene using layering canvases or DOM on top of canvases um, and to try and come over some of those canvas limitations, although there's still quite a lot of them to get over. Um, we can profile to figure out where time is being spent. This is a message you've heard a million times, I'm sure. And we covered a few of the more commonplace and more basic performance techniques, um, such as reusing objects wherever you can, reusing the canvas whenever you can, and preempting the next state. Um, that's all I have. So thanks a lot for listening. And please come through with any questions. Please come find me afterwards.